all for coming today. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about health information, illness beliefs, and the use of new health technologies, and looking specifically at some evidence from malaria treatment in East Africa, uh, specifically Uganda and Kenya. So the motivation for this work comes from the fact that there continues to be very high morbidity and mortality from diseases that are both preventable and treatable. And part of this may be issues of supply, right? So people may not have access to these um, health technologies, or they may not be affordable. But there's also a lot of evidence that even when the technologies are available for free or are highly subsidized, people don't always use them or use them correctly. And some examples are long-lasting insecticide-treated bed nets, which are used for malaria prevention, or water treatment solutions, which help prevent waterborne diseases, and childhood vaccinations. So maybe it's a lack of information then, right? Maybe people are not aware of the health benefits of these technologies, or don't know how to use them correctly. But so far, the effect of information on health behaviors has been quite mixed. So in my research, I'm interested in two main questions. The first is, how do people's beliefs about their illness and about treatment affect their health behaviors? And second, what kind of information could we provide that would encourage, that would modify people's beliefs and encourage them to adopt positive health behaviors? And the goal is to get some kind of insight into the types of interventions that would increase the uptake and use of very effective health technology. My work focuses particularly on tools for the diagnosis and treatment of malaria. And just to give you some background on malaria, it's caused by a single cell parasite that's transmitted by mosquitoes. The primary symptoms are quite nonspecific, and they include fever, chills, headache, fatigue, and nausea. <coughs> It's a major cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide, though about 90% of the deaths occur in sub-Saharan Africa. A lot of progress has been made in reducing the burden of malaria over the last 10 years. And this is partly due to increased use and access to malaria control interventions, such as insecticide-treated bed nets, rapid diagnostic tests, which are quick, accurate tests for malaria, and artemisinin in combination therapy, or ACT for short, which is a very effective treatment for malaria. And so in this talk, I'm gonna focus on these two health technologies, the rapid diagnostic tests and the artemisinin in combination therapy, both of which are relatively new technologies. So they've only become commercially available in the last 10 to 15 years. To give you some sense of the malaria treatment context, um, in much of sub-Saharan Africa, including Kenya and Uganda, people tend to rely on the informal private sector for the treatment of febrile illnesses like malaria. And what this means is that the quality of care that they receive and the availability of diagnostic testing and treatment varies quite a lot. <coughs> Since most people don't get a test for malaria, they're quite uncertain about the diagnosis of the disease. And because there's still a lot of older anti-malarial drugs available, which aren't very effective, and they're also at the same time counterfeit drugs, people may be unsure about how effective the drugs are in treating their disease. ACTs, however, are a very effective treatment for malaria. It has a short dosing regimen. It's taken twice a day for three days. The problem is there's a lot of evidence of low uptake of ACTs and incorrect use. So, for example, in 2015, the WHO estimated that only 12 to 22 percent of children under the age of five who had malaria were treated with ACTs. And even if people do take ACTs, up to 60 percent of them in some contexts don't complete the full dose of the drugs. There's also evidence of poor targeting of the drugs. So not only do people or children, especially with malaria, not get ACTs, there are a lot of people who don't have malaria who get treated with ACTs. In some cases, up to 50% of patients who test negative for malaria are still treated with ACTs. So in my work, I'm interested in looking at how beliefs about illness and about the treatment can help us understand some of these health behaviors. 
And we came up with this very simple conceptual model to try to understand the relationship between illness beliefs and treatment behaviors. So at the top here, somebody falls sick and they have some beliefs about their illness. So for example, how likely is it that the illness is malaria? And they also have some beliefs about the treatment, right? How likely is it that the treatment will be effective and will cure this, their disease? And these beliefs then affect the action that they take for their treatment. So whether they get any um, care for their illness, whether they get a diagnostic test, whether they get treatment. And the beliefs also affect whether they adhere to the treatment. So if they get a diagnostic test, do they get an ECT when they test positive and not get an ECT when they test negative? And do they complete the full treatment course? <coughs> And the treatment actions that they take and adherence to the treatment then affects the illness outcome. So whether they recover from the illness and how quickly they recover. And that then feeds back into their beliefs about their illness. And so I'm going to present three studies today that are going to look at different aspects of this treatment pathway. The first study I'm going to look at we'll look at the relationship between illness beliefs and the treatment action. So specifically looking at how beliefs about malaria likelihood are associated with ACT use. The second study is gonna look at the relationship between illness beliefs and treatment adherence, more specifically whether people finish all their medication. <clears throat> And then the third study will look at this feedback relationship. So how does the action that people take and adherence to the treatment affect their beliefs about their illness and about treatment? In addition to these three studies, I'm also going to talk very briefly about some ongoing work on malaria beliefs and treatment behavior. And I'll end with a summary and some policy implications. So moving to the first study, as I said, it's looking at the relationship between beliefs about malaria likelihood and the use of ACTs. As I said, there are very high rates of undertreatment of malaria, particularly in young children. And this is partly because a large proportion of patients don't ever get any care outside the home. At the same time, many patients who don't have malaria are still treated with ACTs. And this is because in the absence of diagnostic testing, it's very difficult to identify malaria on the basis of symptoms alone, right? So as I mentioned, the symptoms of malaria are quite nonspecific. They overlap with a lot of other common diseases. But we know that the malaria infection rate is strongly associated with two factors, with the age of the patient and with the local prevalence rate. So we know that kids are much more likely to have malaria so a febrile child is much more likely to have malaria than a febrile adult. And we also know that a febrile child is much more likely to have malaria in areas of high malaria prevalence. So we were interested in two questions. One is whether ACT treatment rates correspond to patterns of malaria infection by age and by local prevalence. And are these patterns of ACT treatment associated with caregivers' beliefs about malaria likelihood? The data for this study comes from a household survey that was conducted in 92 villages in six districts in eastern Uganda. We surveyed the female household head and asked her about all illnesses in the household in the previous month. And we asked about the symptoms the patient had, what illness she thought that the patient had, and any treatments that were sought for the illness. Indrani, yeah. can you just let us know, is this a period where it's rainy? Um, Yes, yeah. it should be at the part of the rainy season. At the end of the household survey, we tested all household members for malaria with a rapid diagnostic test. And the rapid diagnostic test that we used in this survey actually gives a two-week prevalence of malaria. So it detects the antigen. It's an antigen-based test. Um, and so it can detect a malaria infection that was um, potentially cleared up to two weeks ago. So our sample consists of 1,342 people who had a fever in the two weeks prior to the survey. And we focus on people who had fever because that's the symptom that's most strongly associated with malaria.
So this figure shows um, both the positivity rates and ACT use by the age of the patient. So on the x-axis, we have the age of the patient. And for the figure on the left, the y-axis is the proportion of patients who had a fever who tested positive for malaria. And you can see that about 60% of kids who had a fever tested positive for malaria, but only about 20% of adults who had a fever tested positive for malaria. <coughs> and then on the figure on the right, on the y-axis, we have the proportion of people who took an ACT. And you can see about 40% of febrile patients were treated with an ACT, and that doesn't vary at all with the age of the patient. This next figure looks at the malaria positivity rates in ACT use by village prevalence. So we had 92 villages in our survey. And on the x-axis, we have the prevalence of malaria in two to 10-year-olds, which is considered a stable measure of malaria prevalence. And again, for the figure on the left, the y-axis is the proportion of febrile children, in this case, who tested positive for malaria. And you can see that positivity rates in febrile patients tracks pretty well with the village prevalence rate. And then on the figure on the right, again, the y-axis is the proportion who took an ACT. And that doesn't vary at all with the village prevalence rate. And then finally, we looked at how beliefs about malaria varied with the age of the patient and with the local prevalence rate. So on the figure on the left, the x-axis is the age of the patient. And the figure on the right, the x-axis is the village prevalence rate. And on the y-axis, we have the proportion of the febrile illnesses that were believed to be malaria by the respondent who was a caregiver. And you can see about 30% of febrile illnesses were believed to be malaria. And that doesn't vary with the age of the patient. And it doesn't vary with the village prevalence rate either. In blue line here, I've just added in the positivity rates, which I showed you earlier. And that you can see that there's a pretty substantial disparity between the actual risk of infection and people's beliefs about the likelihood of the illness being malaria. We also looked at some factors that we hypothesized might be important for ACT use. And again, the age of the patient and the village prevalence rate were not associated with ACT use, even though they strongly predict malaria infection. But what we did find is that um, beliefs about whether the illness was malaria was strongly associated with the odds of ACT use, as was education and whether ACTs were available at the closest shop. So just to summarize, we find that malaria positivity rates are strongly associated with both the age of the patient and the local prevalence rate. But ACT treatment rates are invariant to age and to local prevalence. And people's beliefs about whether an illness is malaria are also invariant to age and to local prevalence. We also find that malaria beliefs are strongly associated with whether a patient was treated with an ACT. What these results suggest is that misconceptions of malaria risk may be playing a role in the undertreatment of malaria in young children. Okay, so then moving on to the second set of results. This uh, study looks at the relationship between illness beliefs and treatment adherence, specifically whether people finish the full treatment dose of ACT. That's important because it's quite common for people to take subtherapeutic doses of ACTs. And this has both private costs and public costs. So for the individual, it means that there's an increased likelihood that they will have a reoccurrence of their infection if they don't finish their medication. And for the community, it increases the risk of transmission, and it also increases the likelihood that the parasite will develop resistance to the drug. And that's a major concern because the malaria parasite has already developed resistance to all older anti-malarial drugs, and there's evidence of resistance to artemisinin, which is a, part, a component of ACTs, in parts of Southeast Asia. So there's an urgent need to try to understand the reasons for non-adherence and how to reduce it. 
we came up with a very simple uh, theoretical framework to try to understand this adherence decision. So it's a two-period model, where in the first period, a patient falls ill with what they believe is malaria, and they start taking ACTs. And in the second period, they have to decide whether to finish taking the medication or to stop. The benefits of finishing the medication is that you guarantee that you're cured of the illness. And if you're aware about the benefits to the community, that might also motivate you to finish the medication. On the other hand, there are costs of adherence too. So you can't save the pills for a future illness episode. There's some effort to remember to take the pills, and you might have some side effects from the pills. So this trade-off for this decision we hypothesized was mediated partly by how sick people felt midway through treatment. And this, is, this figure shows the predictions of this simple theoretical model. So we predict on the x-axis, we have how sick people feel midway through treatment. And on the y-axis, we have the probability that the patient finishes their medication. So we predict that there is this nonlinear um, inverse U-shape relationship between adherence and how sick people feel. So if people feel a lot better midway through treatment, then they may decide that they're cured of the disease and don't need to keep taking the medication. In that case, you could have interventions that encourage people to finish their medication even when they feel better. On the other hand, if you take a couple of doses and you still feel really sick, you may decide that the drug isn't very effective and stop taking it. So in that case, you could have interventions that encourage people to finish their medication, um, or you could have interventions that increase the perceived effectiveness of the drug. If you're also unsure about whether you have malaria and you feel either a lot better or a lot sicker, you may decide that the um, illness was not malaria to begin with, and so there's no point continuing the medication. In that case, you could do some diagnostic testing, or you could offer uh, malaria diagnostic testing, which is something that we did, but I'm not going to talk about today. So we conducted a randomized control trial in central Uganda to test some interventions to increase adherence to the ACT treatment regimen. We had 2,641 households who were given just an ID card that allowed them to buy subsidized ACTs at nine local drug shops. And the type of packaging that the ACTs were sold in was randomized by shop and day. So each day, each of the nine shops sold ACTs in a different type of package. And then a subsample of people who bought the ACTs were visited at their home three days later to see whether they had finished their pills. At this follow-up survey, we also asked people about the symptoms that they had each day, how sick they felt, and we also asked them what day they believed that they were <coughs> sort of there. Why did you randomize the packaging? Why did we randomize the, the packaging? So that's our interventions. So we randomized the type of packaging, and I'll show you the, types of, the different types of packages that we tested that were designed to try to increase adherence to the treatment regimen. So as I just said, we, had, um, we randomized the type of packaging. Uh, they were interventions to try to increase um, adherence. And so we had one control group and four treatment arms. The control pack was just the standard ACT packaging, which you can see here. Um, the pills were grouped by dose, so there's six doses. But otherwise, the instructions were just in small print in English, much like if you were to receive a medication here in the US. The first type of package that we tested was something that we called the CATS package. Um, which you can see here. And there were a couple ways that the CAPS package was supposed to increase adherence. The first is, as you can see, it's very colorful, it's very glossy, and that's supposed to increase confidence in the drugs and um, increase the perceived effectiveness of the drug. The second way it was supposed to increase adherence was it had these pictorial instructions, and that was supposed to help people understand how to take the drugs correctly, particularly if they were not literate or couldn't speak English. 
And so although this CAPS package was potentially very effective, <coughs> it was also quite expensive. So we wanted to test some cheaper alternatives. So the first other alternative package that we tested was something we called the CAPS information only package. And it was basically just a black and white photocopy of the CAPS package that we wrapped around the control package. And the idea here was to see that if the CAPS package was effective, was it the information that was important, or was it the colorful, glossy packaging that was important? And then finally, we tested these very simple stickers that we just put on the control package with targeted messages about adherence. So the first said, malaria is not gone until all tablets are finished. <coughs> And the second said, finish all tablets. Saving tablets for later is harmful for malaria control in your community. And these were just supposed to address some of the reasons that people might stop taking the medication. So this figure just shows the adherence rate for each of the six doses of the drug. We find that almost everyone takes the first two doses, but then adherence starts to fall. And about 65% of people took all six doses of the drug. And this table just shows the impact of the different types of packages on uh, ACT adherence. So in column, this is just a simple linear regression. So the first column, the outcome is a binary variable for adherence, so whether the people finish the medication or not. And the second column, the outcome is a continuous variable for the number of doses left. And then we have the coefficients for each of the pack types, which is shaded in gray. And what you can see is that neither the CAPS pack or the CAPS information only package had any effect on adherence. But the two sticker messages increased adherence by about five to six percentage points. So only the malaria is not gone message was statistically significant. And then because the CAPS and the CAPS information package were quite similar, and the two sticker messages were also quite similar in the way they presented the information, we combined those two, and so that's the results in columns four and five. The results are pretty similar. The CAPS package and the CAPS information packages had no effect, and the sticker messages increased adherence by about six percentage points over the mean of 65%. If we just go back to the theor theoretical framework for a moment, if you remember what we predicted was this nonlinear relationship between adherence and how sick people felt <coughs> midway through treatment. So looking at the control group, this is on the x-axis here, we have how sick people said they felt on the second day of the three-day treatment. And this was on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 is they were in perfect health, and 10 was that they were very sick. And the y-axis, we have the adherence rate. So you can see that there is some evidence of this inverse U relationship. So people who felt a lot healthier on the second day were less likely to finish their medication, as were people who felt very sick. And adherence was highest for people who were moderately sick um, midway through treatment. And if we add in the sticker messages, which is the dashed line here, you can see that the sticker messages increased adherence, uh, particularly for the people who were feeling much better midway through treatment, who might have otherwise stopped taking the, the medication. We also asked people what day they believed <coughs> that they were cured of malaria. So that's what we have on the x-axis, the first day of treatment, second day, or third day. And the y-axis, we have the adherence rate. So if you look at just the control group, which is the blue dots, Adherence increases by when people felt, um, or when people thought they were cured. So the later you thought you were cured, the more likely you were to finish your medication. And once again, the sticker messages seem to work best for the people who thought that they were cured early in the treatment course on the first day of treatment. So just to summarize these results, we find that about 35% of patients do not finish their, um, the full course of the ACT treatment regimen. We find that the short targeted messages seem to work better than the fancy information dense packaging. And even though the impact was modest, we do think that it's quite cost effective. So the sticker messages are quite cheap and we estimate that it costs about 80 cents to $4 <coughs> per averted malaria infection due to increased adherence. 
We also show that it encouraged patients to complete their medication even when they felt better or thought that they were cured of malaria. And we find that one of the strongest factors associated with adherence is how ill people felt midway through treatment. Okay, and then the last study that I'm gonna show you is looking at how treatment action and adherence to the treatment guidelines affects people's beliefs about their illness and about treatment. And the treatment actions that we're going to look at is specifically diagnostic testing and ACT treatment. So malaria diagnostic testing has increased quite rapidly in the public health sector in Africa, particularly since 2010 when the WHO recommended that um, all suspected malaria cases should receive a confirmed diagnosis before being treated with an ACT. But there's a lot of evidence of low compliance with the malaria test result, particularly when patients test negative for malaria. So in some contexts, up to 50% of patients who test negative for malaria are still treated with an ACT. We were interested in looking at how health worker adher adherence to the malaria treatment guidelines, so whether they test for malaria and whether they treat based on the test result, how that influences people's beliefs about malaria and about treatment. The data for this study was based on a household survey that was conducted in Western Kenya um, with 2,065 households that had a history of fever or a malaria-like illness in the past month. We asked if the patient sought any treatment for the illness, whether they were tested for malaria, the result of the tests, and if any drugs were taken. We also asked people about their beliefs, so about their beliefs about how likely the illness was malaria, how likely it was that the drugs that they took were effective, and also their beliefs just generally about whether a malaria positive test is correct and a negative test is correct. These beliefs were elicited using a five-point Likert scale from very unlikely to very likely. For this study, we limited the sample to patients who had ever visited a formal health facility, and this was for a couple of reasons. The first is, at the time, uh, malaria diagnostic testing was only available at health facilities in Western Kenya. So this was a sample of patients who could potentially have been tested for malaria. And we also think that uh, once the patient had made the decision to visit a health facility, the testing and treatment decisions were likely to have been made by the health worker. Um, so we have some evidence to confirm that this is the case, but I won't present that today. Okay, so we find that about 82% of patients who visited a health facility were tested for malaria. And this figure shows ACT treatment rates, the percentage of people who are treated with an ACT by patient's test status. So about 70% of people who were not tested were treated with an ACT. People who tested negative were less likely to be treated with an ACT, but we still find that about 50% of them were still given an ACT. And about 90% of patients who tested positive were treated with an ACT. So it does seem like the test result guides treatment behavior to some extent. We also looked at how people's beliefs about malaria likelihood were associated with both testing and with treatment. Um, so on the x-axis, again, we have the test status of the patient. And on the y-axis, we have the percentage that believed that it was very likely that the illness was malaria. The white bars are people who were not treated with an ACT, and the blue bars were people who were treated with an ACT. So if you compare just the white bars, you can see that patients who tested negative were less likely to believe their illness was malaria, and patients who tested positive were more likely to believe their illness was malaria. And the same is true of if you compare just the blue bars. So the test result does seem to influence people's beliefs about whether they had malaria.
And then if you compare the white bars to the blue bars, you can see that people who were treated with an ACT, regardless of their test result, were also more likely to believe that their illness was malaria. So it seems like both the test result and ACT treatment affect people's beliefs about the likelihood that the illness was malaria. We also looked at people's beliefs about ACT effectiveness and how that varied with test status. So in this figure, the sample is limited just to people who were treated with an ACT. And on the x-axis, we have their responses to the question of how likely was it that the ACT you took was effective. So it's very unlikely to very likely. And the y-axis is the proportion of people who um, answered, who gave each of those responses. So about 70% of people who were not tested for malaria or who tested positive said that it was very likely that the illness was malaria. But for patients who tested negative and were incorrectly treated with an ACT, which is the red um, line, you can see that only about 40% said that um, the illness was very likely to be malaria. So it suggests that incorrect treatment in this case is reducing people's confidence in the effectiveness of the drug, perhaps because they, they don't feel better once they take ACTs when they don't have malaria. So just to summarize, we find that ACT treatment is associated both is associated with the test result, but about 50% of patients who are testing negative are still being treated with an ACT. We find that people's beliefs about malaria are associated both with their test result and with ACT treatment. And we find that those who tested negative for malaria and were still treated with ACTs <clears throat> seem to have lower confidence in the drug than patients who tested positive or were not tested. What these results suggest is that improving health worker adherence to malaria treatment guidelines, which means that they test for <clears throat> malaria and treat with ACTs only if patients test positive, that's likely to have two benefits. One is that it directly improves ACT targeting. And second, it could also increase patients' confidence in testing and in treatment. And before I end, I wanted to just give you a sense of some ongoing work that we're doing on beliefs about malaria and uh, treatment behavior. So if we look back at the treatment pathway, ideally what we'd like to do is measure people's beliefs at each point along the treatment pathway. So before they're tested for malaria, right after they're tested, before they get any treatment, and after they get treatment. And we're planning to do this using a longitudinal cohort of households. <coughs> the benefit of which is we can also look at how people's beliefs at the end of one illness episode then feeds back into their behavior for the next illness episode. And we can also see how people's beliefs change over time as they become more familiar with both testing and treatment. And then finally, just to summarize, we find that there's some evidence that people's beliefs are associated both with ACT use and with ACT adherence. And we also find that diagnostic testing and treatment influence people's beliefs about malaria and about treatment. And there's some policy implications from these studies that I presented. So the first study suggests that public health messaging should really emphasize the importance of children getting care, febrile children getting care for their illness, getting both tested and treated, um, even when the caregiver thinks it's unlikely that the illness is malaria. The second study on adherence really suggests that we need interventions that encourage patients to finish their medication even when they feel better or believe that they're cured of malaria. And finally, the third study suggests that interventions that improve health worker adherence to the malaria treatment guidelines, for example, through trainings, could also increase confidence, patients' confidence in testing and in treatment. We find some evidence that providing information can influence health behaviors, whether that's through the packaging of the drug or through diagnostic testing. 
but it likely depends on the content of the information, how the information is presented, the source, um, who is providing the information, and how frequently the information is provided. And so that would be an area for future research. And finally, I think the work just highlights that people are making decisions in the context of a lot of uncertainty. And so there might be some value in looking into approaches to improve the accountability of informal healthcare markets. With that, I'd just like to acknowledge a few people. Uh, Wendy Ramirez is my postdoc mentor, and she has been great so far. And she's um, leading the study in Kenya, which I presented some data on. Jessica Cohen is my PhD advisor, or was my PhD advisor. Um, I collaborated with Jessica on the two studies in Uganda that I presented. I'd also like to thank the study teams in Uganda, here at Duke, and also in Eldoret, Kenya, who helped design these studies, implemented them, collected the data, cleaned the data, and also provided very valuable feedback. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Hey guys, Andrade, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Uh, I learned I learned a lot, and you covered you covered a lot of material. Um, so we actually have yeah, Randy. <laughs> I was just gonna say we have about about twenty minutes, I think, for questions. So we uh, we have some time for discussion. If you have questions, Randy. Question. Uh, I found your your the second study really interesting about the effects of different package labeling on mm -hmm. adherence um, and. And in particular, the real simple, you know, sticker uh, message was the most effective. I'm curious what proportion of the people in the study area spoke English, and did you consider using any local languages? Yeah, so that was a, an issue. The reason we decided to do the messages in English was just because um, people speak a lot of different languages, and so English was something that everyone at least spoke a little bit of, or it was a sort of a common language, and it was something that could easily be implemented by a supplier and could easily be scaled up, not just in Uganda, but in other countries. <coughs> um, we also did pre-test, so we tried some of these messages, so we tried to use words that were relatively familiar um, and messages that would be easily understandable by most people. We did look at the effectiveness of the messages by whether the um, respondent uh, spoke English or didn't. And so the sticker messages did seem to be more effective among people who spoke English, which is what we would expect. But there was no statistically significant difference between people who spoke English and people who didn't. When you did the pilot testing, did you did you get a sense for how many, how often people could just look at the pictures without reading it and understand what to do? Uh, Assuming that was part of the point of the pictures, or was that just to sort of help for the fancy packaging? Mm -hmm, yeah, the, either the black and white or color. Yeah, I'm not sure about. So the fancy packaging was not something that we designed. That's kind of used in a lot of social marketing um, type approaches and or like NGOs and um, governments. So that was not a package that we designed, but it's used a lot in these types of um, interventions. Um, I actually was not involved in the, that part of the study, so I'm not sure if we looked specifically at whether people um, understood the pictorial instruction. So, but we did look at, so sorry, we did look at, um, at the end of the survey, we did ask people, so we gave them a control pack, and then we also gave them the CAPS pack, which is the patency packaging, and then asked them to tell us how they would take the pills. And there was no difference between the two, so mm -hmm. people seemed to understand how to take the pills just as well with the control package and with the patency packaging. Mm -hmm. So that, that might be one reason why the CAPS package didn't really have any effect, because that was one of the supposed goals, was that it was supposed to improve understanding. Right. Um, 
is finances uh, ruled out here? I mean, they're drugs free for going in for these interventions, or what's the? Yeah. So in most of these cases, the um, the drugs are heavily subsidized. So in the in the first, so for the packaging drug, we sub, we provided subsidized ACT. So they were subsidized by about ninety five percent. Um, so still not cheap, but much cheaper than they would have been otherwise. I can, um, I have somewhere the actual cost, but they were heavily subsidized I'm just uh, for the how first. Rolled out in terms of. It might still have been an issue, but they were heavily subsidized, and these are the prices that would that they would probably be able to <laughs> in general. In the Kenya study, the ACTs should have been free in the public sector. Um, they probably cost something in the private sector, though they're still subsidized. And for the first study, um, looking at ACT use, that was when there was a big global subsidy program being rolled out, and so most of the ACTs at that time should have also been subsidized. I just have a follow-up to that. So you've got uh, folks who are going to these um, physicians to get diagnosed. Um, when they go in and get diagnosed and this test is run and there's, they test negative, um, is the impetus the same as it is in this country, essentially? Oh, I feel sick, give me something. So they give them ACT yeah. like we give uh, uh, antibiotics. Well, yeah, so I think it is a very similar kind of attitude that you test for malaria, it's negative, but you don't know what else it is. There's no other alternative diagnosis, and so you treat with ACTs. I think the other reason is that, um, so there are a couple of other reasons. One is that the guidelines before testing became readily available, the guidelines at least for children used to be that if they have a fever, you should treat with ACTs and, or treat with anti-malarials. And that was when the drugs were a lot cheaper. Um, but I think it's hard to switch over from that um, guideline where it's thought that all fevers are malaria. And so even if you get a negative test, you want your risk averse and you think it's still probably malaria and so you treat. Um, I think that's part of it. I mean, sort of a follow-up on that is how much are comorbidities a concern that, I mean, did you control for that, like that people are having two febrile yeah. at the same time? Yeah, unfortunately we didn't, so it's quite possible that um, the febrile illness that they have may not necessarily be caused by malaria, even if they have a malaria infection, and it's possible that they have another illness as well. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any information on the other illnesses that they have. Did you look at all whether, I don't know what the side effects associated with ACT use are, but whether side effects and their severity affected confidence in the treatment or adherence? Yeah, so the side effects of ACTs, they don't seem to be that bad, and very few people in our study reported any side effects from the ACTs or reported that as a reason for stopping the medication. Um, so in the case of ACTs, at least, we don't think that that's the major reason for non-adherence, but certainly for other drugs, that might be a much bigger issue. Is that also true for the people who were tested negative for malaria, but also prescribed it? Like, does are side effects worse for those people, or is there no evidence of that? Yeah, I don't. I don't know if anyone's looked at that. I don't think. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know if the side effects would be worse if you're negative, but potentially the ACTs have no positive effect if you don't have malaria. Uh, based on what you've gleaned from these studies, um, aside from the packaging <coughs> implications, what do you see as some potential interventions to address some of these issues? Yeah, so for the study in Kenya where we saw that, you know, beliefs, confidence in both testing and treatment are influenced by um, health workers, adherence to the management guidelines. I think the implication there is that really there needs to be a lot more focus on 
ensuring that health workers follow the treatment guidelines. So they test for malaria and they only treat with ACTs if the patient tests positive for malaria. And that's gonna be a bigger issue because um, people are now talking about expanding diagnostic testing outside of formal health facilities where people are going to make their own decisions about whether to get tested, not just the decision of whether to go to the health facility, but the decision of whether to get tested for malaria and whether to treat based on that test result. And so um, improving health worker case management could have beneficial effects there as well. Um, for the first study, I think it just uh, suggests that there is these misperceptions there are these misperceptions of malaria risk, and so encouraging people that all children should, you know, all children who have a fever should get care outside the home, should ideally get a test for malaria and treated based on that test, even when you don't think that it's likely that the illness is malaria. So not relying on your own kind of beliefs about whether the illness is malaria or not. And Jordan, I have another question. Can you go? Oh, did you have another question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you go back to yeah. I think your last conclusion slide, or perhaps one before, and you had three bullet points. Um, no, let me go back one more. There were three. What was it there? The um, the three policy implications. Where is that? There. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, of these, three, it seems like there's there's a there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of different yeah. points along the process of. Uh, seeking treatment access to care, actual care, and the proper care right. to deal with this. And, and so do you see, is there, is there one that you think is sort of the biggest bang for the buck that you can target that will actually reduce the transmission of malaria? Yeah, I think that, that's a hard question. I mean, it's hard to say what would have the biggest effect. I mean, I think these all highlight that people are making these decisions in a lot of uncertainty. And so there's uncertainty about whether to seek treatment, there's uncertainty about the test and whether the test is correct, there's uncertainty about whether the drugs are effective, there's uncertainty about when you're cured of the disease, like when you can stop taking the medication. Actual uncertainty or perception of uncertainty? Well, yeah, perceptions of uncertainty. I mean, so is the test actually highly sensitive and specific? Yeah, so the, the rapid diagnostic tests that um, are now being rolled out and were being used in um, a lot of contexts are very accurate um, for malaria. The microscopy testing, which was used before uh, rapid diagnostic tests, it is considered the gold standard, but in field conditions, it can be quite inaccurate. And so that's another reason that people are maybe less um, confident in the test results, but their rapid diagnostic tests are quite accurate. So I'm not sure that there's one um, one solution to all of these. I think the solution would be kind of really effective regulation and um, you know information, like just reducing all of these uncertainties. But that's a very difficult <laughs> intervention to implement. So I think you kind of need interventions along each of these pathways trying to um, maybe decrease some of this uncertainty. Yeah, but uh, presumably if the, if the test is quite accurate right. and if ACT continues to work, although that's conditional on people being adherent, I guess, right. but assuming those two things, and it's about getting people in to get tested yes. and about the physician's appropriately prescribing to the non right. to the non positives and then for the positives the patients yeah. hearing and so you at least can knock out two of those you just have the other th I mean just the right. other part but of <laughs> those that, three like, a lot of people don't go to the health facility right. to begin I mean, with they go to you know the local drug shop where sure. testing may not be, be available and if it is available then people may not always know how to interpret the test Right, but, but but so is like the World Health Organization or other control groups tar targeting one of these as sort of the best place to intervene to, to expect some change? I'm not sure. I mean, I think those two that you mentioned are the big ones to try to get people to get treatment and to get tested and adhere to the test guidelines. Those would be. So, 
But it seems to me, though, that your number two is really the critical one because if you've got people who are taking the meds but aren't finishing it, mm -hmm. and all of this drug goes by the wayside like the other ones do, it doesn't matter if you test positive, it doesn't matter if you come in for treatment, the drug doesn't work anymore. Right, so I think adherence is a big one just to maintain the effectiveness of ACTs, but also that's part of the reason we want testing, right? We don't want the indiscriminate use of ACTs, we want ACTs to be targeted to people <coughs> who need them, to people who have malaria. But presumably, even if it's incorrectly handed <coughs> out, it's not affecting whether or not it kills the uh, antigens for malaria, right? I mean, so if I don't have malaria and I take it, what's the cost versus if I have malaria and I only take half a dose? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people can also have sort of subclinical infections, so they may have the parasites but not be having any symptoms or not test positive, and people can also get infected um, while they're taking the drugs. So, um, ideally, we <laughs> we would not want people who don't have malaria or don't test positive to be taking ACT. Thank you for a nice talk. Um, I don't remember the the proportion of folks who actually tested positive in your study for malaria. Uh, what was that? So in this one, it was, yeah, I didn't mention it. I think it was something like, well, so 720 out of, it was about 60, 70%. 60, 70%. Yeah. Okay. So the 40%, we are not quite sure. So he's a, I'm trying to pick up uh, your yeah. brain in this case. So across the border in Tanzania, we're focusing on fever, you know, non-malaria non uh, fever causing. Uh, mm -hmm. and. One thing I've been trying to wonder is where in your field as you go forward, um, because 40% of that probably could be attributed to these other rickettsial diseases and right. diseases that jump from human to animals. And in your view, where where is that going? The One Health type of people and your malaria type of people, where, where should that be going? Where is the intersection? Um, and maybe what should we should be thinking about at this point? Yeah, I mean, I think that it is important to look kind of beyond malaria, particularly as the malaria burden is decreasing. Um, a lot of these fevers are not caused by malaria, and so it's important to try to think about what other illnesses or diseases could be causing those illnesses. And that would also help this problem of um, compliance with the test, right? Like if you test negative and you don't know what else it could be, then you just treat with ACTs. But if there was some way to identify some of these other potential causes of the illness, that would um, potentially improve the compliance with the tests as well. So yeah, I think it's definitely um, worth looking beyond malaria to some of the other types of diseases that might be causing these fevers. I, I didn't get a chance to say before I agree with Charles, but just a really neat spread of work. And, and the first one I'm curious uh, with the perceptions, I mean, you, you have this clear recommendation that people should be more aware about childhood malaria. And, and that's clear that there's like an under, under perception that people aren't treating. But then there was this other, the other part of that was about people's perception of the community level prevalence of malaria and that, uh, and so I'm curious, so you know, I'm curious like what we might, be able to figure out about what people know about malaria in their community versus whatever the general perceptions are about malaria. And then if there are any potential risks that could occur if you're promoting awareness about malaria like we do, yeah. right, like NGOs do, uh, about, uh, you know, broadly, but the variation of the, you know, the, rel you know the, the relative risk of malaria in people's communities right. is quite high. You know, if there could be some sort of risk, uh, some negative outcomes from people, you know, over treat again, over treat sure. malaria because they yeah. think it's a problem everywhere, even though it's not. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think the message that we want to get across is not that you know you're underestimating malaria. Um, you should go get treatment for malaria. I think the idea is to just encourage people to seek care, to seek diagnostic testing, because there's definitely the concern that if you say, you know. Um, 
malaria is a lot more common than you think, then we might get that risk of overtreatment of malaria. But I think it would be more about encouraging people that, you know, if you have a sick child, go to the health facility, get tested for malaria, because you may not always be sure whether it's malaria or not, and it's difficult to identify um, the illnesses just based on the symptoms. So, yeah. I have one more question. Okay. Um, you mentioned adherence, well, you sort of saw a modest uh, intervention effect right. of the stickers, right? 9% as the average. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did you see any modification of that by certain strata? Are there certain types of people who are more likely to adhere than others? Yeah, I have a figure somewhere in my appendix. Five. We looked at a different a bunch of different like demographic factors. So for example, age, which we might have thought like kids would be more likely to finish their medication. Mm -hmm. There wasn't really any effect there. Yeah. So most of the demographic factors, wealth, education, didn't really have much effect on adherence. So um, which is, yeah, interesting. And it's also, it's found in a lot of other studies as well, even here. Um, but adherence really doesn't seem to be influenced that strongly by demographic. It's just an innate human quality that certain people yeah, will appear and others won't. I mean, that's the interesting thing. Even if we got people to, you know, finish the medication when they feel better, that probably still wouldn't get us to 100%. Yeah. So there's clearly something else going on with non-adherence as well. Any last questions? Well, let's thank Indrani again. Thanks.